lightning rolling. It's amazing how much work you do. And, uh, you know, I think the whole consciousness community really appreciates all your efforts. And I know I certainly do. And um, I'm delighted to be here with everyone this evening. Um, I'd like to do something that we do at the, um, at the Sacred Stream Center where I teach um, and online, of course, um, as part of the Sacred Stream classes, and that's to do something called opening circle. So I'm going to say a phrase and you can say it after me. The sun is a circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The moon is a circle. <clears throat> the earth is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. We are a circle within a circle. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, so again, I'd like to just introduce myself a little bit in case you don't know too much about me. And I'd also like to have a moment where everyone introduces themselves so I can learn a little bit about what brought you here. And so I can you know, kind of aim my talk at uh, what, what you would like to learn. And um, so uh, my name is um, Isa and I am the lead teacher at the Sacred Stream Center, which is a school for consciousness studies in Berkeley, California. And now, of course, we are online in a very big way. And um, uh, we've, we've been online actually for several years, but I'm really glad we had that little bit of a head start because we have really had to up our game on the online presence of our classes, but it has really, been a very wonderful thing because we're able to reach even more people um, in the same way that the Dharma Collective has been able to reach so many more people being online. I think that there is a real hidden, hidden, uh, maybe not so hidden silver lining um, to this COVID crisis that has brought us all together this evening to talk about you know, how do we practice in difficult times? You know, how, you know, how do we practice and why do we practice during difficult times? So um, what I'd like to do is have everyone introduce themselves. Maybe, um, I don't know, Noam or, or, or Katie, you could um, ask, you could uh, say people's names and they could introduce themselves. You could introduce yourself if you could say your name and where you're calling from. And what drew you to this um, lecture? That would be really helpful. I had written this uh, talk talking about internal practice and external practice, right? So it's interesting that you have that uh, that as a theme. And um, so I'm glad that we're kind of on the same wavelength there. And I want to talk from that perspective. I want to talk about how do we manage our uh, experience that's arising within us and how do we practice with that? And then how do we meet the experience of other people and practice with that? And um, there's a one word that I would like to say kind of unites both, both internal and external practice. And that word is samsara. <laughs> and I want to just talk about what creates samsara because we are in such a strong set of winds of samsara right now. And I want to remind all of us about what samsara is and how we got here, <laughs> right? And what's keeping us here if, you know, if we have not become enlightened yet. So, um, so, I think, you know, for, of course, all of you know that samsara is the, the word, the Sanskrit word that is used to describe the experience of living an unexamined life. It's, it's the experience of really being caught in not understanding the consequences of our thoughts and the consequences of our actions. And so we enter into a cyclic round of taking an action that has a consequence that we often don't assign to be a result of that action. And then we take another action and 
in an effort to try to free ourselves from the consequences of an action taken without an attempt to be aware and attempt to maintain a sense of compassion in our actions. And then that creates another set of consequences that we then try to defend ourselves against. And of course, we all know the activity of the Four Noble Truths, the way we tend to defend ourselves against the consequences of the actions that we take where we have not been aware of what our motivation and our intention are. And so therefore cannot be aware or able to gauge the effect of our action is aversion, attachment, and misknowing or ignorance, right? These are the three main ways in which we try to defend ourselves against the consequences of taking thought and action without considering our intentionality and whether or not it is based in compassion and the concern for the welfare of everyone, right? So you know, and you can see in these times, there are a lot of people that are trying to take action with the welfare of everyone involved. And then there are also a lot of people that are not doing that. And we see the terrible consequences of that very, very clearly. This is one of the really kind of gifts of this time because we can see so clearly and so unequivocally the results of action taken without consideration of intention or without seeking to base our intention in a place of compassion. And we can see very clearly the consequences of actions taken without the consideration of the welfare of everyone. And so in some ways we could say this is like samsara on steroids right now. And I think it's difficult to look away from samsara in the way that we might ordinarily. I think all of us who are practicing know that, you know, this samsara thing is here and we're trying to find our way out of it. And, you know, and we want to do that as much as we can, but, you know, sometimes it's easier to do something else. <laughs> and, um, and now, you know, it's the, the ability to distract oneself is really reduced and the importance of practicing is really enhanced. And the, the need to practice is really enhanced. It's, you know, it's like in ordinary times that are already, you know, kind of very involved with the effects of uh, the Four Noble Truths, you know, about aversion, attachment, and misknowing. Um, it, you know, we, we, we can see, we see these things are happening. But, you know, there's a way in which we think, well, you know, I'll, I'll take care of that tomorrow. Or, you know, like, I'm just going to let myself have this kind of little tant attachment tantrum here because I just really, it feels good, right? You know, but, but then immediately you recognize it doesn't when you lose your center during these times because the center in the collective is tearing apart right now. And that is why we must maintain our own personal center within us. And the, the way we do that is by understanding how we get involved with samsara and using our practice to help us stay not necessarily away from samsara. We have to be in samsara, but where we are, well, we don't have to be, but you know, here we are. 
Um, but it's not like I'm trying to make samsara a thing we're trying to run screaming away from. I mean, we have to be here and practice, um, but we have to practice in the midst of this. And in order to do that, we have to hold our center. And as I say, the collective center is falling apart in a fairly intense and consistent and persistent way. And the way that we remember our center is by understanding what causes samsara, understanding the nature of karma, action and consequence, understanding the effect of attachment, aversion and misconception, and becoming more aware of how all of those things contribute to our choices. And one of the, you know, becoming aware of all of this is very important, but it's, of course, it's so exaggerated now, it's kind of hard not to be aware of it. But often within ourselves, we may not see these things so clearly. And this is why it's important to meditate, right? Because when you meditate, when you do, you know, there's lots of forms of meditation and we're going to do several kinds this evening. But the first, the first level of meditative practice must always begin with the breath or with some other place of one pointed focus, because that one pointed focus brings us back to our center. And when we can stay in our center with relaxed awareness, and we, when we can find our way back to our center by watching our breath and becoming aware of other discursive thoughts that are coming into our minds and actively choosing not to follow them and actively choosing our one point of focus on our breath, we then get some internal spaciousness so that we can become more aware of where our intentionality is and what kinds of actions are coming out of the thoughts that emerge from that intentionality. So, and we can thereby understand the, and track the consequences of actions that we take. So we have a much better chance at navigating samsara with clarity and making choices that do not bind us within it, even though we find ourselves here practicing, hopefully getting to a place where our own practice becomes not only a base and a center for ourselves in the midst of everything coming apart, but becomes a place where others can also take refuge as we take refuge together in the Sangha. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a meditation on breath to help us develop that one pointed focus, step outside the winds of samsara, find our center so that we can become more aware of our intention and our motivation so that we can have better informed action and so that we can gauge the consequences of that action and thereby have greater control of our choices in terms of how we meet those consequences. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a meditation. Just letting yourself get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And as you do, just noticing where your breath is. Just finding your back straight, <clears throat> your feet crossed or flat on the floor, your hands in your lap, 
your eyes closed or half closed. <clears throat> As you're finding your breath. And as you feel the surface under you, feeling how you're supported externally, just noticing how your breath supports you internally. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And if any other thoughts should come into your mind, just let them pass through like clouds passing through the sky. And then come back to your breath. Remember, the past is gone forever and the future is not yet here. All we have is the present moment in our breath. Just allowing yourself, if you've been breathing through your mouth, to breathe through your nose. And if you've been breathing through your nose, you can breathe through your mouth. And just feeling the surface under you again. And just following your breath back out into the room as you breathe out. Again, feeling that support under you, even as you feel the breath within you supporting you. As you open your eyes. And just taking a moment to reflect on your experience. Of developing that one pointed focus. Just noticing if you are not perhaps a bit more aware of your mind. A bit better able to track where your mind is trying to go from one minute to the next. And if we're going to develop an internal practice in terms of dealing with the chaos and the disruption that is all around us, 
we must have this center. And so this type of meditation is very important to do, even if you only do five minutes a day. This is a very short meditation that we did because we have many things that we're trying to get to this evening. But you could spend, you know, hours doing this meditation. Um, but if you just did it five minutes a day, it will help you become more aware of your mind and where your intentionality is. And it will help you make decisions about where to place your, your thought and your actions and thereby better able to meet and recognize the consequences of your thoughts and your actions. So this is, this is the internal practice. Um, I thought, um, I think I'll go ahead and just keep talking. I know there may be some questions or some thoughts or some comments coming out of that. So you could go ahead and just type those into the chat. Again, you know, we always ask that the chat just be for questions for the teacher and not cross talk um, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Um, but if you have some questions, go ahead um, and type them in and we'll take them at the end. Because I'd like to focus now on external practice. So again, you know, with this kind of ground, then how do we meet the world, right? And how do we meet, like you were talking about, how do you deal with your anger at people not keeping themselves or other people safe? Or, you know, how do we deal with our upset and distress at seeing so many people having such a difficult time? And one thing that I find is very helpful, this is something that Robert Thurman told me. And, uh, you know, you may know that I teach with him. Um, I've been teaching with him for many years. And... He, he said something in class one day that I thought was really helpful. He said, you should see the other as someone who cannot take away your good humor. <laughs> and he said, you know, you should defend your good humor as a treasure. And I think that this is important because when we see our responses to other people's actions, taking away our stability and our good humor, we have given them a lot of power. If we allow other people to take away our hard-won spaciousness through our internal practice, we have given up control to them. And we have to remember that because it's as you see how crucial it is that we maintain control over our intention, our thought, and our action in order to preserve a center from which we can come in a clear and precise way and from which we can track the consequences of actions. So in dealing with others, Think about that. That has been very inspirational to me. And I think that um, if we can hold on to our good humor, no matter what is going on, I think we have a better chance of dealing with whoever is in front of us. And another tip that I'd like to offer you in terms of meeting other people who are perhaps quite undisciplined in the, their responses to what's happening is to think about tolerance. And one way to think about developing tolerance is to think about and to understand that the other person is suffering and that they do not understand the consequences of their actions clearly or they wouldn't be doing whatever negative thing they're doing uh, to kind of try to take away your good humor. And they are creating karma for themselves through their lack of discipline and through their inability to understand how they are working with their mind and their heart 
And this is a terrible state of affairs. So easy to have compassion for someone who is lost in that way. When you know that they are creating much more karma for themselves, karma being the consequences of the actions they're taking, not that they're creating some kind of punishment or something like that. I go into the nature of karma extensively in the um, entering the stream classes that I teach at the sacred stream. Um, it, it, it's the first, um, and in the first, uh, it's the first of the Buddhist psychology classes that we teach. We have a whole academic program in applied Buddhist psychology. And the first one is called Entering the Stream. And we explore karma and the Four Noble Truths and the concept of refuge extensively there. And also, I teach a class called Relationships and Karma. And uh, there we really see <laughs> where the pedal hits the metal in terms of karmic response. So um, uh, I, I, I have uh, people in the administration of the foundation uh, of the sacred stream that always tell me that we should change the name of that class because it's a little scary, you know, relationships and karma. And I always say, well, people should be scared. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, you know, it, you know, karma is a real thing. And again, I'm not talking about punishment and reward. And I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the consequences of your actions. And we all know that we have, when we have taken an action that is ill-considered, that where we did not hold on to our center and where we created harm, the consequences come back again and again and again. And so when you see someone who is so undisciplined and so unkind and so, and so unthinking about other people, you can easily step into a place of compassion when you recognize how much harm they're doing to themselves through harming others. That's really important to remember because it's so easy to want to get angry at someone and to, and to feel desperate and to feel like, this is not going to change this. I can't control this person into doing what they need to do in order to keep themselves and others safe. And I think when we can give up that idea that we could ever have controlled them, when we give up the idea that they cannot understand or they're not interested in understanding the consequences of their actions and we can't make them see it, then we have to use our center to create this, this from the spaciousness within us to create spaciousness around us where that tolerance is there that pre helps us preserve our good nature and have compassion for the other person as they are caught in the throes of poor discipline and the choice to engage in negative activity. And we're going to talk all about that negative activity in just a minute. So, um, this is really important in terms of how you interact with other people, understanding that you can't control what they're doing, that you can't make the other person be different, that you can't get the other person to see your way or to see you in a particular way that you can only control your own reactivity. And, you know, if you have, if you're living in close proximity with people that are very undisciplined, you can always have the choice to step out of the relationship if you have to, if you need to. You can preserve yourself. You don't have to stay enmeshed in a series of toxic interactions. You can step out of that. And if that means stepping out of the relationship, that means stepping out of the relationship, but that is a choice that we can all make. And we can all choose to not engage with these, these fields of negativity that steal our good humor from us. So this is the external approach to practice. We've talked about the internal and the external. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, different types of negativity and ways of dealing with them, both internally and externally, by doing a little bit of an exploration of 
samsara through the um, vehicle of the six lokas. And, um, but before I do, I'd like to see if anyone has any questions on anything that we've covered so far. Okay, looking like we don't have any questions, all right. All right, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk about the six lokas. Now, this is a concept that you may know about. This is, um, this is uh, loka means location or realm. It's the word actually, a Sanskrit word that um, come, that's where we get our word location, right, loka. And in Buddhist practice, there are several ways of understanding the teachings of the six lokas. And they, as I mentioned, they are six different realms and or six different states of mind. Now, this is two different ways to practice. Some schools of thought focus on looking at the six lokas as an actual realm, a place that you enter into and a place that you leave. And other schools of thought look at the six lokas as a state of mind that you enter into and a state of mind that you lead, that you leave. And then there's some schools of thought that look at them as both a place that you enter and a state of mind that you enter and a place that you leave and a state of mind that you leave. And these six lokas are, um, you often see them depicted on, in tankas um, in Tibetan Buddhist practice. And you see Mara, the god of illusion, this very big monster, like fellow with big teeth. And um, he's holding this wheel and uh, a, a, you know, a circle that is divided into six parts that, is, um, that has a lot of very descriptive and detailed information in each of the six sections of this circle. That, and the, the depictions um, are all related to the types of activities that occur in that particular loka or location. And, in, and we're going to look at each of those, what types of activities occur in each of those locations. Um, but in the center um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to, to understand the depth and breadth of tankas and and the imagery that they are evoking and the teachings that they are distilling um, because in the center of this wheel that's held by this great monster mara the god of death the god of illusion which is a reminder about how engaging in samsara so the six lokas is basically a tour of samsara and which we'll be doing in just a moment. And it, it reminds you that um, all the, this whole realm of engaging in these different emotional experiences that characterize these lokas, it throws you into illusion. It throws you into death, which and, and both illusion and death are outside of the realms of that spaciousness, that centered place, where you are able to calm your discursive thought so that you can connect with your own Buddha nature, which is connected to the ground luminosity, which is outside of the realm of samsara, or it infuses samsara, but it helps you step, well, it depends on how you're looking at it, but um, it, it helps you step away from the effect of the winds of samsara by stepping into it. So, um, so, but at the center of this incredibly complex depiction of uh, samsara, you have at the center, you have often have a wheel, uh, you have a, a pig chasing the tail of a snake and the snake is chasing the, the tail of a rooster. The rooster is chasing the tail of a pig, of that same pig. And so you see, and the pig, 
it, the pig is a symbol, a symbol for uh, misknowing or misconception. And that's chasing the, the tail of the snake, which is attachment, which is chasing the tail of the rooster, which is, uh, uh, the, sorry, the snake is aversion, chasing the tail of attachment, the rooster, which is chasing the tail of misconception. And you see that whole thing that I was talking about at the beginning, where you have the consequences of actions just going around and around in a circle when those actions are taken with a lack of consideration and understanding about the importance of a disciplined intention. And when we allow our minds to set for thought and action based in attachment, aversion, and misconception. So you see that at the center of the six lokas, is this whole activity of attachment, aversion, misconception, attachment, aversion, misconception, which is part of the machine that generates the and, and sustains the unenlightened activity that's happening in each one of these six lokas. And all of that takes place within the jaw or the maw of this monster of illusion and death. Right. So if you're not scared yet, you will be soon <laughs> because you're going to understand your samsara is not the place you want to be. And you're going to be willing to practice all day long, night and day, in order to be able to emerge from this place to take refuge in the Sangha, to take refuge in the Dharma, to take refuge in the Buddha, in our own Buddha nature, that spacious place within us. So six lokas, talk about the six lokas. I should have, um, I should have, uh, I, I wish, I'm sorry, I didn't have a, I should have given you a tanka to look at, but you can look at them uh, on, the, uh, on the internet. You can find illustrations. One of my favorite things to do is to talk about tankas. I don't know, you might've been at a San Francisco Dharma Center event where I talked about this wonderful tanka about Avala Keteshvara. And, or Chenrezig, and um, all of the different amazing things that emerge from the tankas and the t in terms of teaching. It's just amazing. So I just want to honor this method of teaching within Buddhist thought. But let's return to the six lokas. Okay, so the six lokas, as I mentioned, are six different realms, six different states of mind. And each of these realms or states of mind is characterized by a particular seed emotion. And let's start with the hell beings. So the realm of the hell beings is a realm whose seed emotion is characterized by anger. And um, this is, uh, I'm going to speak at length about the nature of anger on Thursday night, where I'm doing a free webinar uh, dealing with difficult emotions in difficult times. Um, you can register for that um, at the sacredstream.org website. Um, it's a free event. And um, so I'm not going to spend as much time as I might talking about the different types of anger because anger is really one of the more difficult emotions that we deal with. And there are many types of anger, some healthy, some not so healthy. But in this case, we're looking at the not so healthy types of anger that are that characterize the realm of the hell beings. And in, if you ever look at a tanka and you see the, the depictions of the hells, um, they, I think Dante must have been looking at um, a, uh, a tanka when he painted the Inferno because um, it, it's quite complex uh, set of images um, indicating a, a really unpleasant things uh, that would make you very angry if you were caught in them. So we have the realm of, of the hell beings characterized by anger. And of course, when anger manifests through our, our actions, um, and we have so many possible manifestations such as tension, arguments, shouting, violence, 
and all the destruction that is caused by anger um, and all and how many people die as a result of anger is uh, enough to really you know to really consider that is to really uh, look at the roots of your own anger and in I teach um, a model a counseling model that I developed called depth hypnosis it's d-e-p-t-h not death hypnosis and in that practice we have a lot of methods for using the altered state we work with the altered state in uh, a rather creative way to um, help people move inward um, through hypnotherapy hypnosis and we kind of do interactive practice actually to help people um, plumb the roots of their anger and resolve the roots of their anger through past life regression, prenatal regression, age regression, and, and other types of processes that are actually shamanic in nature. This is where um, the depth of depth hypnosis becomes evident because it's this meeting place of Buddhist practice and shamanic practice and energy medicine. But so we have a lot of ways of working with anger and getting to the roots of anger in depth hypnosis. And of course, we, there are some very good ways to mitigate the effect of it uh, through Buddhist practice. Um, uh, and of course, in the more advanced uh, tantric practices, there are ways of transmuting it. And we will be working with the uh, meditation, if we have time, um, that help mitigate the effect of they, and, and neutralize the effect of all the negative emotions. Um, but the main thing to understand about anger is that it's really uh, not a place where we want to get pulled into in terms of getting pulled into a cycle of attachment, aversion, misunderstanding, attachment, aversion, misunderstanding. And one of the quick ways to deliver yourself from anger when you find yourself caught in the midst of it in interacting uh, with other people, or if you find it arising within your own practice, is to understand that the antidote for anger is unconditional love and to work um, within deity uh, meditation practice, for instance, within uh, traditional Buddhist practice, one way to develop a very deep um, connection with unconditional love is to do a deity meditation practice where you um, enter into the field of the deity, such as Avalokiteshvara, and uh, allow the unconditional love of the deity to enter into the places where you're holding anger. And that helps you transmute it within yourself. And that gives you instruction on how to approach others uh, in the same way that the deity has approached you, then you can approach others with that same kind of unconditional uh, love, which will help you help you step out of the state of mind of the hell beings or the realm of the hell beings, depending on where you're practicing. Then the next loka that we're going to be looking at is um, the realm of the hungry ghosts. And the hungry ghosts are often depicted as these beings that have very, very big bellies and very, very tiny mouths so they never get enough to eat because they're always hungry and so and they can't get enough food down their gullets to satisfy them and you might have guessed the seed emotion for the uh, loka of the hungry ghosts is greed and when greed arises there's just a, this feeling of an excessive need that can never be excuse me, that can never be quenched. And it's like drinking salty water when you're thirsty. So of course, greed um, is closely associated with attachment, uh, especially attachment in the form of lust, uh, money, um, and uh, the, just the accumulation of experience that you see many people caught in and just sort of 
unthinkingly kind of digesting experience and not really uh, letting it register in, in any kind of a way that makes them feel satisfied. And you see this a lot these days, uh, especially as people are trying to uh, get away from whatever is, is um, distressing them. You see, this is one of the drivers of addiction. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very important when you see someone who's caught in this realm of the hungry ghost, of course, to have compassion for them and to get out of the way <laughs> so that they're not trying to consume you. And that's why you need to have your internal practice so that you have discernment, so that you can recognize someone who's just trying to digest experience, digest you as part of their experience and draw you into their own uh, attachment cycle. And, um, and then you have a reaction that might be um, drawing you further into it, either through anger or your own greed or, or some other form of negativity. So very important to um, recognize someone caught in a, in a hungry ghost place and step away. And, um, and interestingly enough, um, when you are lost in the grips of greed, you look outward, right? And so people are always looking outward to bring things in. And so the task, if you find yourself caught in this state of mind, is to look inward and to look into the place within you that is generating that void, that place that is never fulfilled. And there's always something that may be doing that that doesn't, nothing arrives. I always tell my depth hypnosis students, nothing arises in a vacuum. So there's always a reason for something. And again, in depth hypnosis, what we would do is we would go actually sail into the heart of that void to try to understand where the roots are. And we do that very carefully with a lot of different types of processes that are very supportive. Um, but that do go into the heart of, of, that, of that, that void that a person um, is caught in when they are caught in these kinds of addictive, um, lust-driven kinds of uh, power-hungry kinds of states. And of course, when you see people like this around you, I mean, if you have that going on within you, you sail into it and um, I were, again, if we have time, I do have a meditation that we can, that you can choose. We may not have time, but I'll describe the meditation. Um, but if you, if you have other people around you that are being, um, hungry ghost-like, the antidote to greed is actually generosity. So if you find yourself caught in greed internally, look to see how you can be generous with yourself. And if you have someone around you who's trying to suck you into their greed machine, be generous, have a boundary, but be generous, offer them something of help and to, and to cultivate, but something of help that is truly of help, like be generous with compassion, be generous with kindness. At the same time, you need to have that boundary down. And again, you know, we don't have time to go into all of the different parts of the antidote, but you have a beginning here with this practice of generosity. And then we have another realm of the animals. And the animals, with the animals, the seed emotion or the seed state of mind is uh, ignorance. And, you know, as a shamanic practitioner, of course, you know, my hackles go up, you know, animals are not ignorant. Animals are not stupid. Animals know what's going on <laughs> because, you know, uh, working with the animal spirits and uh, is such an important part of shamanic practice. But, you know, I was, I was, um, I was speaking with um, Jimpa about this, um, his holiness, the Dalai Lama's interpreter, you know, and, you know, he, he and I are, are, we've done a lot of collaborations together, um, including we, we hosted a, um, 
tour for the monks from his uh, monastery, from actually his cohort in the monastery. And so we spend a lot of, there was a time where we were spending quite a lot of time together. And, um, you know, I brought this up, you know, I said, you know, what, you, what was this thing about, you know, the hungry, you know, I mean, the, the realm of the animals and the animals being ignorant. And, and he goes, well, you know, calm down, calm down, you know. And, um, you know, he, he said, um, he said that, that the idea there is that they don't have a will of their own, that they can be entrained into something that they may not necessarily want to agree with and not be able to have control over that. And I thought, okay, I can calm down now. All right. Um, and that is true is that, and so that, that ignorance of that is characteristic of the realm of the animals is that state of mind where you don't have control over your mind and other people can control you. And this is really, really important right now because of all of the conspiracy theory, all of the making truth into lies and making lies into truth that's happening um, with this effort to control information and to have a lot of misinformation to make things, um, you know, for political gain or for some other type of gain. And so this is why it's so important to work toward the antidote of ignorance right now, which is wisdom. And because uh, you, you cultivate wisdom by, you know, by having, uh, you know, rational thought, you know, if, if this is being said, what are the roots of this? What are the consequences of it? Is this make, did it, will this now be true or not true? You know, you have to be very, you have to be very discerning, develop a very discerning mind. And this is what the nature of wisdom is. So the cultivation of wisdom is so important, particularly in these times. And so, um, you know, uh, and it's, it's very important to understand how, again, as I was talking before, when you're dealing with people who are undisciplined, they are generally lost in ignorance. They have lost touch with themselves. And, and it's very important to have compassion for them and to do your best to provide insight if they have ears to hear and if they have eyes to see. Again, you can't control people into consciousness. I, I always joke around and say, you know, I wish I could legislate consciousness because I would. <laughs> Very un-Buddhist, I know, but uh, we can't do that, unfortunately. But we can, we can try to provide opportunities for people to reflect upon their motivations and their actions, and thereby offer an antidote uh, to ignorance um, and to help people step out of this particular loka. Then uh, we have another uh, realm. Uh, which is the realm of the humans, which is the realm that is characterized by, guess what the realm of the humans is characterized by? Take a minute, think what's the dominant emotion here in the realm of the humans? You may not guess, I was surprised, jealousy. So jealousy is of course, uh, you want to hold on to what you have and you want to draw back what you have, uh, whether it's a possession or a, an emotional relationship. And you always see the source of happiness as being outside of yourself. And, um, and you are, but at the same time, you are closed to your own sources of, and your own resources of goodness. And so, and so you have this, this need to have some external attachment to something that is not of you because you are closed off to your own resources. And of course, you know, we see, we do see this very often and often we find ourselves in the grip of that jealousy, especially when we find ourselves you know, really having less than we need to have. 
so easy to become jealous of other people. And we can find ourselves in the grip of someone else's jealousy, which can be very, very har harming. And, and especially during this time, as people are really losing contact with their inner resources, jealousy becomes a way that people try to gain a foothold in other people's experience because they've lost their ability to have a foothold in their own experience. And the antidote to jealousy is an opening of the heart. So if, we have, if we're caught in jealousy ourselves, by opening our heart, we will have better access to our own internal resources. And that will help loosen the grip of the jealousy. And if we see someone else who is jealous, if we can have an open heart toward them, recognizing again, remember how much karma they're creating for themselves, how much suffering they're creating for themselves, then we can have an open heart and have the wish that they find their own resources. We can do that loving kindness meditation. May you be well, may you be happy. And by in that way, avoid the grip of their jealousy and hopefully help them if they're willing to be helped through that kind of dedication to their own well-being. And um, so that's the realm of jealousy. That is the realm of the humans. And um, there's two more realms and I'm gonna go over them all again. I probably should have said them all at the beginning so that you knew where we were going, but I'll say them all at the end. Um, the next one, it's an exploration, a discovery. What is the next one? We're having so much fun here with jealousy. What could be more fun, right? What could be more fun is the realm of the demigods. And that is the, is characterized by the seed emotion of pride. And so, um, we all have seen and demonstrated for us on a daily basis in our political realm, the effect of pride right? And the feeling of pride has to do with a sense of territorialness. Wars are caused through the pride of individuals and nations believing that they have solutions to other people's uh, problems. And, um, you know, the, that where you think you're better than others, where you think you have the solutions, where you think you know the best. And, um, of course, if we find ourselves caught in this, we know that we have to work with the antidote, which is humility. And so uh, by trying to become more uh, cognizant of our limitations, we become humble. By becoming more cognizant of our our shortcomings and our and 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 generous toward our shortcomings we become more humble right where you where you you just you naturally accept okay this is my shortcoming this is my limitation i can be generous to myself in this and it allows me to have a sense of humility that takes me away from that overblown sense of pride that I might've been engaged in. Because one of the things that you often see, this is important to note, a lot of times when people are very prideful, the reason they're so prideful is because they have a sense of unworthiness or they have a sense of limitation that they can't stand. So you see this polarity between pride and unworthiness. Or, and if you can be generous with your limitations, then you won't fall into that unworthiness. And you can offer the antidote of humility without feeling that it's going to take you into a place of unworthiness or not good enoughness, right? So, the, the, so in this way, you deliver yourself from the realm of the gods, the demigods. And, um, and, and when you find other people caught in this, 
remember that polarity because I can assure you anyone who's strutting around like a peacock saying they know everything and that they are a very important genius, they must have a sense of unworthiness or a sense of limitation that is unbearable that they have to puff themselves up to get away from. So very, the way that you deal with that and others is to have compassion for that place of unworthiness, that, pl that compassion for that place of limitation. And that's a way to work with it externally. And then the last is a very interesting realm. It's a very, very classically Buddhist description of a state of mind, which is the realm of the gods. And the realm of the gods is a very interesting place because it is characterized by a balance, an uneasy balance of all of the negative emotions. And so you have the, the way that you would experience that is sort of like LA, you know, where everything is great. Every, you have this, you know, the, the classic kind of stereotype of LA you know, where everything, you know, it's a sunny day every day. Everybody's got lots of money. Everybody's a beautiful, every, a beautiful person. Everybody's got all the possessions that anyone could ever have. We're just having this realm of the gods experience, right? But underneath everything, and just underneath all of that is this rumbling of anger, jealousy, greed, misconception about the effect of actions, uh, um, pride, it's all right there, right under this sort of facade of, you know, the LA experience, the stereotypical LA experience. And at any moment in the realm of the gods, you can be plunged into any one of the other realms in a very dynamic and forceful way. And so this is very uneasy balance trying to stay out of that. And I think a lot of people, especially in the materialistic West, live in that state. And I think a lot of people were living in that state to a high pitch just before all of this COVID happened. And I think a lot of people have been plunged into one of the other locas in a very difficult way. And so when you see someone acting in that way, this sort of stereotypical LA, you know, drive the big car, have the big cigar, you know, kind of way. Um, important to immediately have compassion for them because at any moment they could get plunged into a very difficult situation and they would have very few tools to help them get out. So again, compassion is a very, very helpful thing. Um, and the, and when you find yourself caught in that place, you know, perhaps putting on airs, you know, pretending that you have everything perfect in, in order to make other people feel like they, that you're different than, than you actually are, you know, you may feel less than you want to present to the world. Then the way that you get out of that for yourself is to become more self-aware. Why are you doing this? what is the motivation in trying to create this facade that is unreal? And that self-awareness will help bring you into a better balance with, um, with all of these different emotions. It's not so precarious. And um, so that's a tour of our six lokas of these different states of mind. Again, I'll go over them again. We have the hell beings, and this loka is characterized by anger. The antidote, of course, is unconditional love. And then we have the loka of the hungry ghosts, which is characterized by greed and whose antidote is generosity. Then we have the realm of the animals whose seed emotion or seed experience is ignorance and whose antidote is wisdom, the cultivation of wisdom. And then we have the realm of the humans where the seed emotion is jealousy and the antidote is the opening of the heart. And then we have the realm of the uh, titans or the demigods whose seed emotion is pride 
and whose antidote is humility. And then we have the realm of the gods where all the different emotions that are negative are held in this precarious balance and the cultivation to get to better balance, the cultivation of self-awareness is what is the antidote to, um, to that particular uh, state of mind. And so in each of these states, uh, each of these lokas, I talked about how you can use your practice to meet others when they're in that state and how you can use your practice to meet yourself in that state. And um, hopefully this has been helpful. And of course, you know, you can remember the, the talking at the beginning, the internal cultivation of spaciousness to help you with your own internal practice and the external uh, practice where you're developing tolerance and compassion for others to help you in meeting other people when they're having a hard time maintaining discipline and, uh, and um, order <laughs> within themselves um, and finding their center. So um, I wanted to see if anyone has any questions. Any questions? Is everybody still here? I hope. <laughs> I'm actually not looking at the screen. I look at a, at a camera. I see that Tanya has a question. Tanya, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, thank you. There we go. Thank you. Um, so, so the realm of the hungry ghosts with the seed emotion of greed, and then the antidote is um, um, generosity but then there's the then there's the realm of the demi wait no the realm of the human realm which is jealousy jealousy and greed seem to me kind of similar right because they're kind of both grasping yeah um can you kind of talk a little bit about like the difference between those two because the antidote is different um because for jealousy it's the opening of the heart um you're right. They are really similar. I think that jealousy, the, the way that jealousy, for me, when I think about the difference between the two, jealousy is often expressed energetically. It remains unseen and people are working kind of behind the scenes to take energy from one another when they're jealous. A person who's jealous is trying to, is taking energy, right? And with greed, you're actually taking material things. I mean, you can also take other people's energy as well. But if I, if, I think about, if I think about the difference between the two of them, I think about it as in terms of a um, one is more subtle than the other. They're, they're ex very similar expressions, but one is expressed more grossly than the other, and the other is expressed more subtly. There's a thought. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Any other questions? I, I have, a, Tanya, thank you for that question. I was wondering the same thing, but I, didn't, I don't think I could have expressed it as well. But um, I have a, a sort of a comment, in, which is that in dealing with these with other people, it seems like the antidote is more often than not compassion. And it, I'm, I'm just thinking of that in terms of the internal versus external practice and, and how you were positioning those at the beginning. Well, compassion is always a base, right? You always, you know, like when in doubt, have compassion. I always tell my students, the safest place to be is in compassion, yeah. right? So that's a base, but the thing is, as you are developing as a practitioner and as someone who understands the nature of the mind more fully, you have different types of different qualities of states of mind and qualities of behavior that are, that are designed to meet the particular negative expression exactly where it needs to be met. And compassion is a base, mm. 
But you know all this, you, you may know the stories, for instance, of the development of the, the um, Dharma protectors, especially um, uh, Mahakala. And the Dharma protectors, of course, are these very fierce beings that, that seem like they're going to just be so ferocious, but they have hearts of compassion. And the uh, emergence of uh, Mahakala, I, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure this is Mahakala. It might be Yamanta, Yamantaka. I, I get those. They're, they're very, they, of course, they're not the same, but they both have the same ferocious character to them. And um, the story is that um, there was this sort of plague of the, of, that had been caused by this demon that was running amok um, in the countryside, you know, bringing in, you know, deluges at the time when the harvests were going to be taken in and, you know, bringing in, you know, uh, terrible droughts, you know, when the fields were just being planted, you know, just all these terrible things that this demon was doing. And everyone was praying to Tara, Tara, please deliver us, you know, please with your compassion, come to us. And Tara was like, they wouldn't get anywhere with her compassion, right? So, so, I mean, she was having all this compassion for this demon, but it wasn't stopping the demon. So then this, this Dharma protector emerges from her field and meets the demon with all of the ferocity that the demon and all of the, and meets all the places of negative intention that the demon is moving out of in taking these actions and quells it with skillful means and the ability to meet all of these different manifestations of negativity with a compassionate heart. But there's all these skillful means that are involved in doing that quelling. So hopefully that makes sense to you in terms of why you, you have the cultivation of compassion as a basis. But then particular negativities require particular antidotes in order to meet them properly and quell them both internally and externally. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Isa. Uh, you're welcome. All right. I think we're at uh, nine o'clock. So um, sorry we don't have time for more questions, but um, it certainly has been a pleasure being with you this evening. I hope these remarks have been helpful, a helpful contribution to the Wise Action series. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for inviting me. I'm always, I'm always honored and it feels like a privilege to be with the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So um, thank you for having me and thank you all for being here and listening. Hopefully you have found something of value here. And um, let's go ahead and close circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. Thank you everyone for being here and I look forward to being with you in circle again soon. Take care. Thank you so much, Isa, for being here. It is always an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be able to spend time with you. Um, this was ex just exactly what we were envisioning with this series, being able to take this knowledge and information that is so ancient and reflect it directly to our own time. Thank you so much. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that was incredible. We all really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. And for everyone who's here, we're starting a basically a community around um, practitioners who are interested in both this inner work and the outer work. There aren't there are more of us now than there used to be, but it's still a community of people that is um, rare and special and doing this work together. Um, so keep coming to these classes and we're starting a discussion with the people who were here last week about how to keep the community connected online. So stay tuned for more um, about that. Um, so there's a link in the chat for the net, a couple of upcoming classes. There's a link in the chat to sign up for the Sacred Stream newsletter to learn more about depth, D-E-P, depth, <laughs> hypnosis, um, and the other offerings uh, coming from the Sacred Stream. 
and then this video and the recording um, of Isa talking about uh, the Chenrezig Tanka are on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you subscribe to that, you'll get notifications when this video is up and you can also go back and find the Chenrezig uh, video. So uh, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and say thank you, I would invite you to join me in just thanking Isa uh, again. Thank you, Isa, so much for being here. Thank you, Issa. Thank, Thank, so Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really great Thank teaching. You. Really appreciate it. Thank you.